was great. in this room, but I kind of just got my ass kicked by that ending again. <laughs> uh, Dee, just that performance at the end when you're giving him the CPR and five. Go ahead. Okay, you're about to say something. <laughs> well, it, uh, as a director, you know, I, a friend of mine once said directing a movie is like being a witness at an auto accident. <laughs> <laughs> I watch it. I was watching the movie, and I was just sitting back there, totally amazed at the work these people have done. You know, just just basically what a director does is a director maybe will work with a writer and try to put together a crew of good people and give them a little bit of direction. But it's really the execution of a movie that makes the difference between a good movie, bad movie, good movie, mediocre movie. And as I was watching it tonight, I'm just overwhelmed again with it, and so impressed with the way these people executed this film. D. Wallace, Charlie Bernstein, the composer, and there are other people. Danny, there are, Danny. And Danny Guterro. Yeah. 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 In a second, I, I'd like, if you know, possible, D. to talk a little bit about working with Danny. But uh, there are just two people that I also want to mention that aren't here tonight that contributed so much to the movie. Uh, Neil Travis, the editor, and uh, Jan de Bond, the cinematographer, both did it. Well, then I guess as we jump in, uh, Charles, one of my favorite things with the score here, and in my opinion, I'm not a composer, won't pretend to be, but a, a, a real composer, in my opinion, knows exactly when and when not there needs to be music. And that is one of the most incredible things with this film here, is that when the score is there, it is to boost, and it is for ex its exact purpose, but also when it's not there, it's to make us all fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you just want, you know, wanted to talk about the process of working together, um, how you guys came up with when and when not, and uh, the cues that you used. Sure, sure, sure. First of all, I have to say, uh, looking at this picture, I think this is the first time I've seen it since uh, we did it 35 years ago. Really? Yeah, I mean, not, not uh, I've seen video and so forth, um, especially clips, but I've never seen the whole picture on a screen like this. It's but. exhausting. I have to say, it just looked... Lewis, I'm telling you, I yeah. just thought this this movie came together in such a magnificent way, man. And uh, D, oh my God, and uh, we all owe a debt to Dan Blatt, oh. who's not with us, but who's Spirit Hubbard, the producer. Of Spirit hovers over this in a major way. Yeah. Um, also, uh, just so I'll say something about the music uh, because that falls to me. As I was watching it, it, it kind of feels. Uh, like I haven't seen it, I haven't heard it before, I'm kind of uh, able to think of it, how would I experience this if it wasn't my music? And uh, I, I was satisfied, I can just <laughs> it. But honestly, um, this was in an age where we could approach a score in a much less sanitized manner. Um, it, it, it's more personal, Things are less tested. Uh, uh, Lewis uh, didn't have to hear every cue nine times and eight versions in the ninth one we used. That Thank kind of you. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that goes for takes also. Uh, but uh, so it, it just, uh, it, it, in a film score, you want to have cohesion. You want to have melodies that come back in different ways. I was watching High Noon two days ago, and I was thinking about Dimitri Tiamkin. Not, I don't want to compare myself to him for sure. Oh, but but the, the tradition, <laughs> the tradition of, of bringing melodies back in ways that function differently musically and, and uh, dramatically 
Uh, Lewis was so encouraging of all of that, and, and if you can't be inspired by what Dee did, what can you be inspired by in the other actors? So anyway, I just want to say what a pleasure it was <laughs> and how satisfying it is to see it in this form tonight. Thank you. Uh, um, you guys are here as well, because obviously, I'll bring you to doing the sound editing and everything that you worked on as well is, of course, integral to the, uh, to the score along with us, and again, where, where sounds come in and where sounds don't come in, and that goddamn telephone. <laughs> it's every time, so if you guys want to talk about that process as well. As well. We're, we're session players, you know. We're all part of this orchestra, and we come intensely committed to our instrument. Um, we come into Boston when we play together with the other members of the orchestra, and this was that kind of experience. You know, there were a lot of challenges, I don't know if you remember all of this, but uh, four or five weeks in, the lead dog passed. Um, we came in one morning, and Cubby had passed from Bloat, which is a problem with large dogs. And uh, the, the challenge of getting all of that to happen on, on camera was, it still sticks in my mind intensely. Um, Mo was, I think, the, the growly dog. We had mechanical dogs, we had a man in the dog suit, and then we had a Labrador in the dog suit. So a dog in the dog suit. <laughs> Fun, interesting elements. It's for, for us, it was very early in our career. So um, I, I, I had not seen it like you for, for 35 years up on the screen in, in full, full blossom like this. It was pretty amazing to see about it. <laughs> <laughs> the intensity. And you know, the performance in that car was not far apart from the actual challenge of being in that car. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, animal trainer was a man named Carl Miller, um, who also worked. Uh, he also worked with me on Cat's Eye, uh, and he was an amazing man. Amazing. Yeah. Those dogs were trained within an inch of their lives. <coughs> I mean, I I remember being horrified, you know, when the dogs on top of me, and they're he's drugged. And we had a vet on the set, you know, to take care of the dogs. Not one for me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but they, Carl, they were all trained to go after toys, different toys. Like you would wear one around your neck or in some other area. And, <laughs> and they were all trained to go after toys. And there were how many dogs? Because I thought there were... I thought there were eight, and then yeah. you said there were 13. There were about eight or nine. Wow. Uh, I the, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it, they weren't backup for each other. Each dog had a specific yeah. skill. There was a dog that could growl. There was a That's dog low. that could jump. There was a dog that could run <laughs> and scratch. So, yeah. And Carl Miller had them all trained. And again, it was just a situation where uh, I can't imagine this movie having been made without Carl Miller. Yeah. Just another essential cog in the big yeah. wheel. Dee, you played a lot of moms in movies. You played Uno, which is a kick-ass mom. You played Niti with the weird young thing. You also heard one of my favorite movies. I'm sorry, Lewis, but Secret Admirer, where you played a mom. Oh, yeah. What, how did you approach the role of being trapped in a car with your son and just having to fight for your life. What was the process to go through that? You know, I always feel like I disappoint people when I tell them about my process. <laughs> <laughs> because really serious actors are supposed to have this really serious process. I studied with a man named Charles Conrad who literally changed my life. And the process is all based on getting your energy really, really high so you bypass your mental mind. And it's all absolutely instinctively in the moment. I mean, there's no way. We could plan out things to a certain degree, but you're working with a six-year-old, was Danny? Five. Five-year-old kid and a dog, <laughs> you know? So I had to be on all the time in the moment of whatever happened when we, when we got going. And it, it's, so, so it's always served me well, this 
this technique just to become Donna instead of de-playing Donna. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Lewis, you've done a few animal-related movies. So did John Bach. He also did Roar. He was the DP on that. What was it like working with Jan on this movie? I knew Jan from the 60s when he was working in Holland with, uh, he did films like Kichi Temple and Turkish Delight with uh, Paul Verhoeven. And I was a big uh, fan of his. And so when I took over the reins of this film and had a chance to bring in all the key people, uh, Jan was top of my list. And uh, he and I shared uh, a passion for film, uh, a uh, knowledge of film history. For example, you know, at the beginning, in that scene where Tad is running across the bedroom, and when he turns out the light, the room is elongated, yeah. and yeah, he runs to towards the camera in slow motion, and he goes underneath the camera, and the camera goes upside down. Uh, Jan and I would talk about scenes a couple weeks before we would shoot them, and I would throw out ideas. And I mentioned to Jan, it would be really cool to do a cranes are flying shot in that scene. The crane, and Jan knew what I was talking about. The Cranes Are Flying was a Russian film made about 1962, 63, that ends with a shot of this Russian kid fleeing Nazi tanks, and it's that shot where he runs under the camera and it goes upside down. The, I wanted to do that scene in the car where Dee gets attacked by the dog and she falls back in and tells Tad not to open the door. I wanted to do a 360. I wanted to pan from her to Tad and then continue at 360 back to her and then back to Tad and speed it up until it becomes a blur. Uh, I told, he, I described that shot to Jan and he said, how are we gonna shoot it? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're the cinematographer. Uh, a couple of weeks later, he said, here, I wanna show you something. And he, he'd, he'd had the uh, production department pick up another Pinto they built a superstructure on top, on the roof of the pinto, with a hole cut through the roof, with a periscopic camera on the roof. The whole crew got on the top of the pinto <laughs> when we were shooting this thing, because you could see 360 outside of the window. So again, I'm talking about the importance of execution. You know, the director can come up with ideas, but somebody's got to execute them, and you really need, and in this film, all the pieces fell into place. So that's the kind of relationship Jan and I had. It was so exciting. I would describe a shot or something, and he would make it better. And one thing I wanted to bring up as well, um, and why obviously we have to include Cujo in a Stephen King celebration, but the re one of the biggest reasons I really wanted to show this film is that I think you get something across here that is often lost in Stephen King adaptations, which is the high emotionality. Um, a lot of times, and not that they're bad or less or anything, but a lot of times I think um, people have missed out on the extreme emotionality and the extreme family that King puts into his work, and you really, really obviously bring that in here. And was that something from day one that you had talked about and wanted to there to develop over time as Dee came on and everything? The way I came on this film is it's an interesting story because I got a call from the producer, Dan Black, went down to his office at Warner Brothers, and uh, <clears throat> he told me that Stephen King had recommended me for the film, because Stephen King had seen Alligator and written about it in his book, Dance Macabre. Uh, so I, my agent made a deal with Dan, and uh, it's a long story. I, I fell out, the studio had another idea, they brought in another director. That did not work out, and I got that for sure didn't work out. <laughs> I, every day I came on and said, thank you, God, for this, Dean. <laughs> well, what happened is the studio decided to go in another direction. So I went on and I did a film for Dino uh, Laurentiis. And I couldn't, I, I just felt my bones that this was my film, that this was destined for me, that it was, I was supposed to be doing it. I couldn't understand with the injustice of me not directing this film. <laughs> and I even talked to Dino about it, and Dino said, and then we heard that that director had been taken off the picture, and Dino Lorenzi said, said to me, he said, he said, Louis, he said, you want to do that the movie? He said, I financed that movie. You call it Dana Black. <laughs> and uh, I paid for the movie. 
Well, around the same time, I got a call from Dan Black saying, you know, we've, 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 we've gotten rid of the other director. I'd like you to come back if possible. And I said, when do I start? <laughs> so, but in, in answer to your question, um, I think my interests are, are mainly rooted in realism. And uh, when I took over the, the film, or even before when I was first involved with it, uh, I decided that I wanted to eliminate all the supernatural elements that Stephen King had written in the book, you know, Real Monsters in the Closet, and in the book, uh, Cujo was a reincarnation of a bad cop from an earlier book, and uh, none of that's gonna work for me, so I just took it out and wanted to make uh, the characters real, because what, what I really love about Stephen King is that there's depth to his stories, and what really attracted me to this story, uh, aside from the potential of creating some scary stuff in the car, the, what attracted to me was that it was about fear. I mean, he, he's, a, he's a writer that writes scary things, but this film, more than most of his books, really deals with the essence of fear and, what, and the difference between real fear and imaginary fear. The family is being torn apart by imaginary fears. The, the husband is afraid of economic insecurity and that he can't support his family. Uh, the wife is afraid of being bored, living out the rest of her life in this tiny town from Maine where her life will be wasted and she compensates. She deals with her fear by having an affair with the local tennis bum. And all that fear is uh, filtering down to the son uh, who's seeing monsters in his closet. And it's not until the very end when she's facing something which warrants her real uh, fear, and she deals with that, she copes with fear, that she, she's able to survive and bring the family back together again. And in a large degree, that's a challenge that many people, myself included, face in our daily lives. We spend, you know, trying to separate real fears from imaginary fears. So I don't worry about stuff that's not real. And with that depth of content, that attracted me to the story in the first place. So of course I wanted to make it about real people or experiencing real emotions. I want to give a chance if I uh, do a couple audience questions to throw those hands up or point at you. Uh, right here. Uh, the reference of the monsters in the closet, did that have anything about a future story about it? And were there any other uh, stories that Stephen King had references in this movie? <laughs> Uh, no, that, that's one of the scenes that has no uh, ulterior meaning. It's, uh, that was in the book, or at least, it was, yes, it was in the book. Any more questions out right over there? what it needs and wants. The director puts the energy into the film and then the film is finished and we kind of come in in post-production. And this, this film seemed to be asking for something other than just horror. Uh, and like, as Lewis said, there's a, a story here about family, about relationship, about parenting, about, you know, so many different things. And the music, it's like a gift. When, when uh, Lewis talked about those two shots that he and Jan Devon came up with, the 360, uh, the executed, I should say, and the flip over on the bed, those are two of the most greatest gifts in my career um, in terms of music. I, to be able to score scenes, so the, the, through Lewis, the movie was kind of asking that of me. And I'll just say this uh, for fans of the movie, there will be a Stephen King night at the Tenerife International Film Music Festival next month. And uh, the suite from Cujo will be played. It's a, it's a concert situation. So I just, uh, since that's hot off the press, <laughs> I just finished the, uh, making a, a suite out of the score from this picture. But thank you for that kind of remark. I, I wanted
to say, if you're really interested in all the little details about the making of Cujo, pick up Lee Gammon's book. Yes. No, nothing wrong here. I mean, he <laughs> goes into so much detail and facts about the making of it, you'll be, I was amazed. I didn't know a lot of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any more questions? Right here, come on. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I think I just met Danny a couple of days before we started shooting, right? From my memory. Yeah. Hi, John. Um, you know, sometimes you just get really blessed. <laughs> and Danny Pintaro was a huge blessing for me. That kid, it was like working with another adult actor, or maybe better. And I don't know, we just, um, we would talk it through, like, you know, two adult actors would, but um, I went out of my way to be very motherly to him off the set and say, okay, you know, this is pretend. Because at that age, a child goes between reality and fantasy and often can't tell the difference. Danny, however, Drew, no. Drew Barrymore was like, the two worlds were always co colliding. But Danny was very, very mature. And he always, you know, I was really worried about him when we did the scene where he went into that fit, you know, and was talking to him about it. He said, oh, don't worry, Dee, that happened to me when I was little. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see? You know, when he goes right into it. And I'm going, okay, well, don't have to worry about this kid. So he was brilliant to work with. He was brilliant from a crew standpoint, too. Yeah. It's on. It's on. Um, I remember there, there were a couple times when he designed shots, and he would go to Jan and, and say, here's a shot. And I remember it was in his bedroom, and he said, Jan, I have an idea. We're going to start on this truck, and I'm going to move it over here, and then you pan over this, and I'm listening to it. Yeah, I, I remember him being seven at the time. But still, um, it was amazing, and, and he and Jan talked about it, and Jan said, use the shot. <laughs> and it was not, he, several times he would say that. It yeah. was extraordinary. Yeah, he was. It was draining to see this. I still shake. I have never actually seen the film. I will say it was hard working on it. Oh for so my many God! Reasons, and I never looked at it. But hearing Danny and hearing you in the car, and I remember being the boom operator. We had twelve-hour days every day. There, it was just weeks of going into that car and listening to people being upset, listening to people screaming, and it was a very difficult show on that level for me. Oh, it was a it was really draining, difficult shoot. Draining, and the the you, vet. He doesn't remember <laughs> that. <laughs> Look at We were freezing, by the way. It was Northern California. It was cold. It was rainy. Oh my God, I finally asked him, I looked over to Danny one time and he's going, <laughs> <laughs> so we put a, a heater, remember? You hooked us, the guys hooked up a heater for us in the front of the car so we could put it on between takes. It was hard, it was just tough. Everybody contributed so much. Uh, the production manager was a guy named Neil Maglis. And as some of you know here, I come out of the Rogers Corman School of Filmmaking, Us where the most in, important Us thing too. to do <laughs> on a Rogers Corman film, the most important thing to do is to get a lot of footage in a very short amount of time and don't waste any money. <laughs> so we were on the set. Uh, I think we had scheduled to shoot about two weeks uh, at that farm, but we had a lot of rain. And at the end of two weeks, we had, had about three days worth of footage in the can. And it was raining heavily, and I was standing under an umbrella, uh, waiting for the rain to stop so we could run out and get a shot. When Neil Maclis came walking up the hill, whistling. <laughs> and I said, Neil, 
what the fuck are you whispering about? <laughs> We're two weeks behind schedule. <laughs> Neil stopped in his tracks and looked at me and said, Louie, it's only a movie. <laughs> and <then> continue on. <laughs> Dan Black, the producer, another day, we had a very busy day. We were going to go through three costume, wardrobe, and makeup changes on D during the course of the day. And the makeup lady was not that experienced and it was really slow in my book. So I asked her to ride with me to the location. So Dan Blatt, the makeup lady, and myself rode out to the location and I told her exactly what we were gonna shoot that day and how much time we had to shoot it in. And with three extensive makeup changes, I wanted to spend most of the day on the set, not in the makeup room. By the time we got to the set, she was shaking. She was scared shitless. <laughs> Cause I, and when we got out of the car, Dan came over to me, because he listened to that whole conversation. Dan came over to me and he said, maybe it would be a good idea if we shot two scenes and did them well, rather than do three scenes and being rushed. And that was such a shock to me because I was used to Roger Corman. <laughs> and so that's just one more example of how Dan helped oh, make yeah. it a better film. And even just putting the, the crew and the cast together that he did, he just, and in The Howling too, he, he just had a knack for getting really great, talented people um, who were just ready to pop out, right? To, to make it big. And, and putting everybody together and then being that very kind, very steady, pretty soft-spoken rock <laughs> that guided everybody. The top is set at the top, and I was close to the top, but Dan was a topper <laughs> over me, and Dan had those qualities that he was just describing. And that's, you can't imagine how much that freezed me to uh, be a little more adventurous and creative and take risks yeah, and try hard and pass the same attitude and temperament down to the next group of people so that everybody realizes they're working on a team, everybody's being supported, everybody feels good. And like Jan, as I was saying before, I could challenge him with shots and he would go out and make them work somehow. Well, it was really collaborative, and, I, and in this medium, the more you collaborate, the better the product is. I, and quite honestly, I think we're getting away from that too much, especially in television right now. But uh, um, I know that the scene, and, and this was, I, correct me, <laughs> I think it was improv, or at least my take on it was improv. When, he keeps saying, I want my daddy, I want my daddy. And he said, all right, I'm kissing your father. You know? <laughs> and Dan came up the next day and he said, um, I think you need to watch the Dayton from yesterday. It, this is pretty intense and we're afraid the audience won't like you. <laughs> <laughs> and and I went in and I, I watched it on the monitor and I went, Dan, I think if you cut this out, you're crazy. Any parent that's ever lived has experienced moments where they just want to go like that, right? And if there's any, any uh, experience that calls for that, it's this one, I, I think you're not. And, and I don't know if you guys had a big discussion about it after that, but. Dan would come to me and express his concerns uh, about shots uh, sometimes, or, and, but he always let me have the final vote. For example, that 360 degree shot, the editor felt was too contrived and wanted to take it out and was begging Dan to take it out. So Dan came to me and asked me, and I said, are you kidding? <laughs> See, two of the classy things. Now, that just gives you some insight about, you know, you never know what, what's good needs to stay in, you know, but somebody's got to have the last vote instead of 15 people on the set. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I guess I'm going to oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to concur that producing is the one that's the most project. Yeah. And it's not about them and their character and their ego. It's about what's best for this. Hallelujah. Place. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Thank all of you for coming out. Everyone, please remain your seats right here.